Thanks for joining us today. Um, good morning. We appreciate you taking some time out of your day to be with us. We're excited you're here. Uh, today we're going to be doing a brief dive into inspection, testing, and maintenance of water-based fire protection systems. As we roll along here, um, if there are any questions, feel free to, to, to slide those into our chat box and we'll address them at the end. Um, the live drawing for the gift card will uh, be done after the presentation, uh, after we look at the uh, attendee list. So today's presenters, uh, my name is Adam. Um, I'm a sales manager for Kentucky and Southern Indiana. Um, I've been in the industry going on 10 years. I've been with Ryan going on nine. Uh, my counterpart, Edwin here, he is the sales manager for Indianapolis and Central Indiana markets. So what exactly are we going to be looking at today? Here's our agenda. We're going to give you a brief uh, introduction of Ryan Fire Protection and who we are. Then we'll dive into inspection, testing, and maintenance. Uh, we'll go through some deficiencies and show you some example photos uh, that we found along our way. So who is Ryan Fire Protection? Our mothership uh, is located in Noblesville, Indiana, covering that Indianapolis market. We have um, branch offices in Fort Wayne, Valparaiso. Our Valparaiso branch office covers that Chicago market as well as the uh, Northwest Indiana. We have a branch office in South Bend, Louisville, and uh, newly added Bloomington, Indiana. We're celebrating our 31st year in business, uh, family owned and operated, uh, plus or minus 250 employees at this time. Um, and we, we take a lot of pride and being a full service life safety contractor. And what that means is um, there's a lot of diff there's a lot of uh, ways to differentiate. And one of the ways that we we found was we can inspect, test and maintain fire sprinkler, fire alarm, special hazard systems and fire extinguishers. So this is uh, this is what we're going to be focusing on today, NFPA 25. And what that stands for is National Fire Protection Association. We're going to be specifically looking at inspections, testing and maintenance for water based fire protection systems. Over to you, Edwin. Thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah, we're going to hit a few chapters in NFPA 25 today. Um, there, there's obviously a lot of information in that book if you've ever looked at it. We're going to hit some of the high points here um, for everyone involved. Uh, we're going to start with chapter four, which is typically the most overlooked chapter in the book, which is the building owner requirements for, for those of you who are on the call. Uh, most of you would probably follow fall into this category. Uh, then we'll hit sprinkler systems um, and then we'll touch briefly on fire pumps as we go. Through. Um, just to define real quick though, inspection, testing, and maintenance, um, what they each are. An inspection is a visual examination of a system to verify that it appears to be in operating condition and is free of physical damage. Uh, testing is a procedure used to determine the operational status versus just a visual inspection of a component or system uh, by conducting periodic physical checks such as water flow tests, fire pump tests, alarm tests, trip tests of dry valves, etc. And then maintenance is work performed to keep equipment operable or to make repairs. So that's the difference between inspection, testing, and maintenance. Um, next slide, Adam, thanks. Um, so we're, we're gonna hit real quick here, chapter four, which is uh, building owner requirements. So this is, this is important for all building owners and managers to understand what their responsibilities are when it comes to their fire systems. All requirements for their responsibilities come from chapter four. Um, there are just a few items that fall um, fall on them, I guess. We, we, some of those are, are keeping the temperature above 40 degrees. If you have um, wet sprinkler systems, uh, if it gets below 40 degrees, technically we look into dry systems and other, other alternatives. Um, accessibility to the facility, uh, making sure that when, when contractors show up or, or when the fire department shows up or, or a building inspector shows up, that there's keys, that there's um, you know, the doors are unlocked, there's no bushes in front of FPCs and, and things like that. Um, corrections and repairs. This is this is usually um, confused uh, by a lot of folks. 
So we, as the as the contractor, are the informer, not the enforcer. We give you recommendations on what, what probably should happen within a facility, but it's actually the responsibility of the building owner to make sure those things get done. Um, another big one is changing occupancy and use processes and materials. So for example, if you've got a warehouse facility that you're moving into and the building used to be for manufacturing of metal parts and then now you're gonna manufacture or store rubber or plastics or some other things, uh, it can have a huge effect on the sprinkler system and it's the building owner's responsibility to make sure some of those things are, are brought up up to speed. And then lastly is records. We obviously keep records for you uh, for inspection, testing, and maintenance if we're doing it. Um, but technically per chapter four, you have to keep um, records yourself uh, as well as hydraulic placards, as well as drawings um, if they're even available once you've moved into a facility. Adam. Thanks, Edwin. <clears throat> So uh, chapter five gives us a, a great overview and, and you can look at this table here on our right that uh, shows and tells you exactly what you should be doing and the frequency you should be doing it. So uh, going back to what Edwin said, keep in mind uh, what inspecting versus testing versus maintaining means. You know, visual here, making sure everything's operable, making sure everything stays compliant. Um, we can share this. Uh, this is directly out of NFPA 25. Um, as you can see, there's weekly requirements for uh, building owners and managers. There's monthly, there's quarterly, there's annual. Um, there's additional testing as well um, here. If you're looking at uh, additional required inspections at the bottom of the slide here, um, three-year air leakage, three-year full trips. Uh, these are required for dry and pre-action systems. Five-year internal inspections required for, for all systems, uh, essentially, and then head testing as well. So this table is what we kind of live and, and breathe by uh, in the fire protection industry. Yeah, so the, we'll move here to uh, chapter eight, which is fire pumps. We won't spend a ton of time because it's not applicable to everybody, but a, a couple of um, of important things to note. If you do have a fire pump, there are weekly and monthly requirements for those that, that in a lot of instances we don't handle as the contractor uh, for facilities. They're handled internally. The weekly requirement is for a diesel fire pump, which is every 30 or every week it needs to be ran for 30 minutes. Uh, and then monthly on an electric fire pump for needs to run for 10 minutes. And then annually we come typically and, and we'll conduct a full flow test, uh, test alarm signals and provide any maintenance. Um, I put, put a note in here, the insurance requirements can vary from an FPA. So some, some insurance providers um, will have more strict requirements on fire pump testing and maintenance. Uh, we're, we're not gonna get into that today, but if you have questions specifically, you can reach out to us and we can help you with some of that. Um, in, in the picture here, you can see a, lot, a couple of the things that typically go bad are the packing and the bearings. Um, so we, we just wanted to give you a visual of what that looks like. Most people don't, don't ever uh, see the inside of a fire pump. Um, it's important to note that the, if you do have a fire pump and if you see dripping coming from the packing, you're supposed to, there's supposed to be a leak there. It keeps that packing wet to keep it from dry, drying out and, and failing during a, a fire pump test. Um, so a drip a second is about where it needs to be. Now, if it's like a faucet, um, that's a different story. Um, if it if it's not dripping at all and it's bone dry in there, that's that's another issue. Um, you should probably let us know. We can help you out. Uh, what is a pump failure? So how do we know if a fire pump fails or not? Um, what that means is it doesn't meet 95% of its rated capacity during normal inspection. So if it's supposed to get a certain pressure and a certain amount of gallons per minute, um, at, at, at certain intervals, if it doesn't, if you're not within 95% or 5% of the baseline, uh, it's technically a fail. Like I said, and usually that's a result of the packing or the bearings um, need, needing fixed. I would say roughly 75% of the time. Um, if anybody has questions specific to fire pumps, I'm gonna I'm gonna let it lie here. But go ahead and post in the chat, and we'll help you out. Yeah, I Adam? think it's. Yeah, I think it's important to know that, you know, if they're not they're not make they're not meeting that 95 percent um, of its rated capacity. Yeah, sometimes it could be the packing, um, and, and maybe it is the bearings. But other other times it might be uh, you're you're replacing the whole rotating assembly um, to get it uh, to pass because maybe it's chewed up um, or it's it's just not operating properly or it's too old and it's aged. Um, 
So just a little adder there. Thanks, Adam. Cool. Thank you, Edwin. Um, so as we're coming out and we're doing we're doing our uh, our annual, our quarterlies, our monthly inspections, um, we have we have three different types of deficiencies that NFPA 25 spells out for us. We have non-critical. A non-critical deficiency is simply something that doesn't have a direct impact on the performance of the system. An example of this would be uh, you're you're missing a, a cover plate. You you don't have proper signage. Uh, your, your, your sprinkler head box doesn't have the correct number of sprinkler heads or sprinkler wrench in it. Um, critical deficiencies, however, uh, these deficiencies can have an impact um, on the effect or the performance of the system. And what these, what these would look like, this would be a painted sprinkler head, um, piping exposed to freezing elements, uh, your gauges are in poor condition, things of that nature. An impairment, however, uh, the fire the fire system is out of order. Something really bad is going on. It can have a huge impact, um, which can result in the system not functioning. And uh, an impairment would be you have leaking heads or, or pipe. Uh, you have a cracked fire department connection. You have a cracked fire hydrant. Um, when we do the fire pump test, it did it doesn't kick on. That would be uh, really good examples of impairments. And I, and I hope that makes sense. Over to you, yes. Edwin. Yeah, sorry. Um, Five-year internal inspections. So this is usually a result or stems from an annual inspection. Uh, during annual inspection, we'll note with tags um, and with documentation whether you're due for a five-year internal. Um, a five-year internal inspection is is just that. It's an internal visual um, inspection of the inside of your pipe to see what the condition is. So you'll see there's a couple pictures here, just a couple of examples there. Granted, they're extreme examples. It's typically um, somewhere in the middle here, uh, but just to give you an idea. So what what happens is we open up um, a, a flushing connection, which is the end of a line. Um, we remove a cross main um, and take a peek and then we remove a sprinkler head just to make sure that the orifice of that sprinkler head isn't, isn't gummed up with something, which is obviously the most important piece of the whole uh, sprinkler system. Um, a couple of key things with the five-year internal inspections for those of you who have large facilities. Um, if if there is um, sufficient organic or inorganic material found, we can technically only do every other system. So if you have 20 systems, we only have to do uh, 10 of them legally per code, per NFP 25. However, if we find su a sufficient amount, which is kind of the gray area of uh, materials inside the system, we have to go and in now inspect them all. If there, it is determined that there is significant, a significant amount in enough of the systems, then we'd start talking about a flushing program or, or other um, alternative measures to, to mitigate the um, blockage, if you will. Next slide, Adam. Thank you, sir. Um, now, what, what we're going to do here is just give you some examples of different types of deficiencies that we've seen over the years, just to give you an example as you're walking around your facilities and, and looking up, um, hey, this doesn't look right, or should it look like that, should it look like this? Keep in mind that these are some extreme examples. A little bit, this was considered a loaded sprinkler head. Um, the NFPA 25 has three different classifications, loaded, corroded, or painted. Uh, we'll get into painted in a second, but loaded uh, a lot of times during near diffusers uh, in the ceilings, you'll get a, a, a load of, of dust and debris or dirt on a sprinkler head. A lot of times in kitchens and industrial or, or, or um, large kitchen areas, you'll get sprinkler heads that get grease and other nasty on it. Um, that's technically a loaded head, which is technically a deficiency. Um, this is just to give you an example of, of what a loaded head looks like on the right, obviously. Thanks, Edwin. Okay, so uh, your head, your head you're looking at here on the left um, is a head that has been painted by the manufacturer, and that is okay. The head on our right has been painted by a painter that did not bag it uh, prior to painting. So um, what we do, what we do, what we do not want to see is we do not want to see any paint on the sprinkler head, but what we definitely do not want to see it on the fusible link here in the middle because that could uh, that could delay 
uh, the response time of the sprinkler head. So as we're doing our inspections and we're walking around, we're looking for things like this. We're looking for things like the loaded sprinkler head. Um, and that's why some of you may see see some of these items on your report. And, and that is in a that is a critical deficiency there. Thanks, Adam. The next one is damaged sprinkler head. So damage can be a pretty broad term. Um, what constitute damage can mean a lot of different things. In this particular example, I believe this head was pulled out. It used to be in, a, in an in-rack system and they got hit with a, a load that was on a forklift. That stuff was being entered into a rack and it bent the sprinkler head. How it didn't go off, I'm not sure. You can see the element still in the center of it there. Um, damage though, as you're looking around, can be the deflector. It's, it's supposed to be uh, perfectly round and not bent. You, if you see that they're bent, if you see the head arms are bent, um, something's missing, the, the, um, there's no liquid in the bulb anymore, it's drained itself out or leaked itself out, that's considered a damaged sprinkler head. Also can affect the ability of the head to operate correctly um, and is considered a, a, an impairment or a critical deficiency. Uh, depending on the severity and, and would need to be addressed. So just keep a close eye on that stuff when you're looking around your facility. Thanks, Edwin. Fire hydrants. You can see the fire hydrant on the left here, standing upright, uh, has all its necessary caps um, sealed on. Uh, the fire hydrant on our right here looks like it has been hit by either a semi or maybe a, a lawnmower and it broke at the at the breakaway flange. And, and what we want to do here um, is sometimes we want to investigate. We, we run into fire hydrant issues on a daily basis or a weekly basis, I'd say. Um, sometimes the hydrant on the left here that, that looks like nothing's wrong with it, sometimes we can't get it broke free. The stem is stuck or maybe the stem is, is broke and it's just spinning around. Um, oftentimes, if, if we come across a, a fire hydrant that we can't get to budge, what we recommend is uh, send one of our technicians out for two to four hours, see if we can lubricate it, take the topper off uh, and get it to work. And oftentimes we can. Um, in the event we can't, then, then we're looking at a fire hydrant replacement. But we do see a lot of these, uh, especially in Kentucky and I'm assuming in Indianapolis and uh, northern Indiana as well. But um, don't, don't automatically assume that you need to replace your fire hydrant because it got knocked off the breakaway flange or you can't get it to open. I definitely would recommend calling, uh, calling us and, and letting us get our eyes on it. Thanks, Adam. Uh, yard PIVs and landscape obstructions. We find this a lot. Uh, we understand, I understand that PIVs in the middle of your front yard FDCs in the middle of your front yard can be kind of an eyesore um, as far as your, your landscape is concerned. So what we've seen is a lot of people will plant bushes and shrubs around them in order to conceal them. Technically, that is a, a code violation. They need to be clearly visible. Um, typically, they like to have signs near them so they know exactly what it's for. The example on the left is a, is a really nice example. It's in a strip center. Um, which might have multiple buildings, so that says uh, FTC for and then the building address. Um, the fire department connections right there clearly visible. The PIV is clearly visible. There's no obstructions whatsoever. So you know if there was an emergency, um, fire, fire trucks, firemen know exactly where to go and what to do. The example on the right is a, a really good example of what not to do. The road in this particular example, this is taken from the parking lot, so the road is on the other side of the shrubs um, behind everything there. So if the fire department were to show up at this facility, they would have no idea where the FDC is or where the PIV is because it's hidden in the shrubs. Um, it, it, they would then eventually find it, but it may take five or 10 minutes. And as we know, in, in an emergency like this, um, every minute is important. So um, the, the key here is just make sure that your area around your FDCs and, and PIVs are, are clear and free of obstructions, specifically of um, landscaping items. Thanks, Edwin. All right, hangar assemblies. So picture on our left. Uh, this is a proper way to hang sprinkler pipe and other piping um, off of structural members. As we're looking at the picture on the right, one, we're not even using the proper hanger material. And I can barely tell what we're hanging to. We may be hanging to other piping, possibly conduit, which is really dangerous. Um, so 
as we're as we're walking around during our annual and our quarterly inspections, we're looking we're looking for things like this. Um, this is not a safe way to hang sprinkler pipe. This get in very badly for the customer. Next is painted discussions. I know a lot of facilities have uh, concealed discussions, as concealed sprinkler heads. Um, what happens is what we see a lot is that you know they may for aesthetic purposes may want their ceiling to be a different color or want you know different things to look differently um, in in say an entryway or what have you. The key here is that these cannot be painted just like a sprinkler head. I know this isn't technically the head itself. This is the cover plate, but the way these uh, discussions work is there's the the plate itself is soldered to um, a piece of metal that that connects to the sprinkler head itself and that solder is designed to melt away at 135 degrees and then the sprinkler head typically is 165 degrees so if you paint on there the paint isn't going to melt at the same rate as that solder and what can happen is it, is it may get hot enough for that solder to melt but the paint could have make it stick to the ceiling thus letting not allowing the sprinkler head to operate as it's intended to operate um, which is a, uh, an impairment so the key here is is making sure these things stay clear of paint and other debris um, when you're walking around. Thanks, Edwin. Missing escutcheon, very similar. Missing escutcheon is is a is a non-critical deficiency. Um, picture on the left, everything looks great. Picture on the right, we're missing an escutcheon ring. And what what we what we don't like about this is you can see that there's a gap in between the ceiling grid and the inner ring. Um, and this can have an impact on uh, the response time of the sprinkler head. If there was a fire directly underneath this head, you wouldn't think so, but some of that heat might be able to escape through that gap. Um, and we don't want that in the event of a fire. Last picture here is accessibility to the sprinkler riser. Like, like we mentioned here in the beginning, chapter four, a lot there's a lot of requirements that fall in the building owner. Um, to help us maintain the system for you. And part of that is accessibility, being, having access to the riser, making sure we can get the control valves and making sure we, we can get there to test it, uh, et cetera. The big thing here is that if the fire department were to show up in the event of a fire or even an accident and they want to shut the system down, they may find the riser room, but it may take them five, 10 minutes to get all the stuff out of the way, at, like on the picture on the right. Uh, in order to get to that valve to shut it down. So the, the key is just to make sure it's, it, it's clear of obstructions, there's nothing in the way, um, it's going to be easy to identify the location. I always tell people try to mark a door if you've got it in the closet or in a riser room, try to put something on the door that says, hey, um, sprinkler riser room or FACP fire alarm control panel room or, or what have you, just so it's easily identifiable to somebody who's never been in that facility before. In an emergency situation, um, you'll be glad you did that. Thanks, Edwin. That brings us to the end of our presentation, but it looks like we do have a few questions. So let's let's dive into those here. I'll take one. Um, how can you tell if a fire hydrant is private or city? Well, um, sometimes you can tell by the color of the hydrant. Um, oftentimes what we do in these situations is we'll reach out to the local water company in that area uh, and ask for a map and that will tell us if it's if it's private or if it's city i hope that answers the question i'll, I'll take one adam here um one of the questions is a change in occupancy include a temporary change such as when uh, like a short time where a building is being used to house quarantine individuals um, for a short period that's a really good question and this is obviously a really um, really important now more than ever uh, we, we see this a lot not necessarily the, the quarantine people but in un, uh, other instances like a distillery is going to trans, uh, transfer their operations start making hand sanitizer and things like that it's temporary but how long is temporary is kind of a relative question um unfortunately we are we're, we're the informer not the enforcer so we're going to make some recommendations the ultimate decision maker in that particular instance is going to be the fire marshal or your local local hda authority having jurisdiction um typically what we see for things like that it, there's really not any major modifications you need to make for for housing temporary people um 
it's usually when it goes the other direction where you have you know like i said previously you've got some place where you're doing some light manufacturing and all of a sudden you're going to transfer it to something that is um storing you know rubber tires or something crazy that's when there's a major a major uh switch to the occupancy where, where modifications would need to be changed so in your particular instance if you want to reach out direct after this we can kind of help you walk you through um, the building code and fire code to, to get your point in the right direction but i don't foresee in that particular example any, any uh excuse me modifications that would need to be made awesome i'll take another one a uh, recommendation for cleaning sprinkler heads especially those in a cafe kitchen with grease on them so you know ryan fire protection standpoint is you know we don't clean sprinkler heads if they're loaded and it sounds like you may have loaded sprinkler heads. So when we go into NFPA 25, it's gonna tell you to replace them. So we wouldn't recommend cleaning them whatsoever. Now, if you wanna do that, you, you know, it's your house, you're, you're free to do that, but um, I, I would think twice about it um, from a safety standpoint, um, one being damaging the head, two being accidentally setting it off. Um, and like I said, we've, we've had people do that before. It's just, it's not our recommendation. We, you know, we follow NFPA 25 and, and that's where it says replace them. Adam, I'll add on to that too. So NFPA is changing um, and, and a lot of people like, do like to clean their sprinkler heads. Um, to avoid that. The other thing that we have to look at too is not just NFPA. We have to look at the sprinkler head manufacturer and what their cut sheet says for that particular head and whether or not they will allow us to clean it. So to give you a quick example is if we go in and we say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna clean these heads because NFPA said we could um, in a few in future editions. We go, we clean a head, and then six months later there's an accidental discharge of water from that head. And we take that head out we send it off for independent testing and it was determined that there was damage to the head as a result more than likely of cleaning the head of dust dirt and debris um, the manufacturer of the sprinkler head will not help with the repairs of or, or the cost of the damage for the inadvertent discharge of that head because it was cleaned and their cut sheet, cut sheet said that it is not to be cleaned if there if there's any issues with the head it just needs to be replaced so there's two there's two pieces to that too that can kind of make it a little bit tricky on cleaning heads and, and replacing heads and um, finding a fine line in the gray area of what to do or what not to do. Thanks, Edwin. Want to take another one? Yeah, I'll do I'll do another one here. We got a couple minutes left. Um, one of the questions here is there anything on the sprinkler head to tell what he, what the heat rating is or what temperature it's rated for and the answer is yes uh, typically it is uh, indicative of the color adam can you go back to one of those sprinkler heads uh, sure. the blue the one that's blue sure uh, and the majority of facilities you're going to see you're going to look up in an office building and you're going to see either orange or red um, that is 165 degrees uh, blues 212 greens 286 i believe um, and then it goes up from there so there's set ranges for uh, sprinkler at temperatures and it's required by the sprinkler head manufacturers to um, indicate what they are so you can tell from a ground level looking up really easily what the temperature rating is so it's indicative of the color if you have specific questions or or, or if you're walking around your facility and you have a different color um, you know they get they, they manufacturers make heads up to 500 degrees for certain applications um, so if you see a really weird color that's not orange um, orange red blue or green those are the most common ones let us know we can help you identify what it is but for the most part those four colors are what you're going to see okay do we have time for one more i think we do can a buildup of cooking grease affect the operation of a concealed sprinkler head? Yeah, the answer to this would be absolutely. Um, and and I'm, I'm just guessing, but it, it would be a really cheap fix um, for you to replace your cover plates on your concealed sprinkler heads. I mean, these things are a couple bucks a piece. Um, even if you had 20 of them, you know, somebody could put those on. You know, one of our techs could probably put those on in a half hour to an hour or something like that. 
Um, but like, like Edwin mentioned earlier, we don't want anything on that cover plate to affect the operation of that concealed cap from releasing and then letting the sprinkler head, head come down in the event of a fire. Right. We got it. We have any more? Um, there's a there's a couple questions here that that uh, haven't been posted. For those that we did not answer questions, um, uh, there there's if you posted anonymous, we don't obviously know who you are. If you have those questions and you still want them answered, we do not answer. You can email um, uh, Adam or I here, and we can get them answered for you. Um, if we have your name and you didn't do it anonymously, we can answer those questions via email um, and, and help you guys out. Yeah, so you can always feel free to go to our website too and um, fill out a form with your question and uh, myself or Edwin will, will reply. So we are going to do the uh, drawing here after we print the attendee list. We will notify everyone who the winner is. Uh, we appreciate the time today. Hopefully it was valuable. Uh, anything else from you, Edwin? No, I'm good. I appreciate everybody's time today. Hopefully uh, everyone found some value. Great. Catch us on the next one, everyone. Thank you.